Welcome to our Good Friday service. We have this service each year at this time on Good Friday because this would have been the time when Jesus would have been on the cross. Now, if you want to see the order of service, do have a look in the notes section. Uh, do click on that and you'll see uh, what we'll be doing as we go through the service. And you'll also see notes for the sermon. I'm going to open the service with a prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think again about Jesus dying on the cross, Father, please would you move us by what he did. Help us to understand not only what happened to him, but the meaning of it. Open our eyes to your great plan of salvation achieved by Jesus dying on the cross for us and move our hearts to respond to him. Amen. We're now going to listen to a song that was written by a member of our church family, Brian Mayhew, uh, and that was recorded by him uh, and his wife, Joan. More criminals to kill One wears a thorny crown Some sort of king, they say He must have caused some trouble For he dies up there today Heaven upon a cross the sword him now, they gamble for his robe. He stares at them with sunken eyes like raindrops in the snow. Another on the cross turns to the king and cries, remember me, which saves him for a promised paradise. Heaven upon a cross, the mystery of salvation, the price I couldn't pay, the ransom paid by God's own Son, so I can say. to Christ in heaven for that dreadful day. Heaven upon a cross, his time is drawing near, death's anguish scars his face. Forsaken by his Father God, no longer knowing grace. only son, heaven upon a cross, the mystery of salvation, the price I couldn't pay, the ransom paid by God's own son, so I can say. to Christ in heaven for that dreadful day. Heaven upon a cross. Well, 
Well, in just a minute we're going to pray, but first we're going to say a confession. I'll read the first part of each section, then please join in saying, Lord, forgive us. Almighty God, judge of all people, we come to you in sorrow for our sin. We have lived our lives our way, not with you as our king. Lord, forgive us. We have disobeyed you in what we have thought, said and done. Lord, forgive us. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, forgive us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. Lord, forgive us. Amen. And the great news of the Bible is that Jesus Christ died so that sinners may be saved from their sins. As it says in John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, as we come before you now, we join in praising and worshipping you. And we echo these words from Nehemiah. Praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. So we give thanks that we can approach you freely in prayer because of the sacrifice of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which we remember in particular today, Good Friday, when he was crucified on the cross and died. This happened so that justice could be done and sin punished as it deserves. But by your amazing grace and mercy, Jesus, who himself was without sin, took the punishment for the sin of all those who trust in him. As Isaiah wrote, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Yet he rose again to life and is now seated at your right hand in glory. So we thank you once more for your love and mercy in sending us Jesus, through faith in whom we are washed clean of all our sin. And we pray that this great message of salvation for sinners, freely given through Jesus on the cross, will be spread far and wide this Easter. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be at work in carrying the message of the Bible into people's hearts throughout the world so that your kingdom will continue to grow. We give thanks for our own ministers, Bart and Chris, and pray that you will bless and strengthen them in their faith and that you would give them wisdom in how best to carry out their ministry at this time. Now we pray about the coronavirus pandemic. We give thanks for the efforts of all the doctors and nurses who are focused on treating the sick and on increasing the number of hospital intensive care beds. We pray that patient numbers will stay within the capacity of the hospitals. We pray for there to be enough personal protective equipment for medical staff. We pray that there will quickly be greatly increased capacity to test for the virus. And we pray for an effective vaccine to be developed soon. We also pray for wisdom for the government in deciding upon public health actions such as the lockdown as well as for there to be effective support for people whose jobs or businesses are affected. We commit our church family to you, Lord, and ask that you will protect everyone from the worst effects of the virus. We ask that your spirit will be at work amongst us in helping us to keep reading our Bibles and to keep praying to you, knowing that you hear us. We pray for all those who are unwell or feeling anxious or stressed, that you would draw close to them and give them the strength to persevere amidst the trials and difficulties, and to hold fast in faith to you, the great rock and great redeemer. Finally, Lord, we thank you that you are the almighty God who is in control of all things. We pray for your will to be done in our lives, and that your spirit will help us remember these words from Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now please join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you've ever been involved in a major event, you know there's a lot of planning that goes on. Maybe you've been involved in planning a wedding, and that's taken years to get ready. And if it's a really major event, you get folders and you get charts out and you plan to the smallest of details. You plan exactly what the food is going to be like. You plan what people are going to wear. You plan who's going to sit where so that the whole thing goes really well. You plan and you plan. In the readings that we're about to look at, we see Jesus crucified. This is the most major event in history. This is the event that the whole of the Bible has been building up to. And what we see in these readings is that God has been planning this for all eternity. He's been planning it down to the smallest of details. He's been planning it even so that people who don't realise that they're involved in his plan do exactly what he wants. And because God has been planning this down to the smallest details, even those details have meaning. And so we're going to have the reading. We'll have the reading, then I'll speak and we'll keep alternating like that. And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the notice, we're going to look at the lot, and then we're going to look at the bones. And in each of them, we will see people who are just doing their thing, doing what they should be doing, and yet they are achieving exactly what God plans. So we're going to have the first part of the reading. This is John chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. We're thinking about the notice first. Jesus has been crucified, nailed to a cross, and Pilate has a notice written and put above Jesus's head. Why does Pilate do this? Well, he would have done it for all the criminals to put the charge, uh, the reason why they're on the cross up above their heads so that everyone can see what they've done wrong. And we see in the passage what was written there. Verse 19, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's the charge that Jesus is claiming to be a king. But this is also a dig against the Jewish leaders, the Jewish authorities. After all, they're the ones who've stirred up the crowd to call for Jesus's crucifixion. And they come to Pilate and they say, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Well, Pilate, presumably not liking the fact that his hand has been forced in having to have Jesus crucified, says, what I have written I have written. So saying on the notice, the king of the Jews, was a bit of a poke at the Jewish leaders saying, no, this is your king and this is what's happened to your king, even though they didn't recognise him as their king. But that's the surface level, isn't it, of what's going on. That's Pilate doing his job. But of course, underneath it, you've got God's plan. You see, see through what Pilate has written and see God's purposes here. 
that what you have written above Jesus's head is in fact the truth, that Jesus is the king, but he's not just king of the Jews, he's king of everyone. Now that's uncomfortable for us, isn't it? The idea that Jesus would be a king is not comfortable. We don't like that idea. Uh, the idea that Jesus would be the good shepherd is comforting, or the idea that Jesus is the bread of life. If we're hungry, we can come to him for food. That's a really reassuring thing. Or the idea that Jesus is light in a dark world would mean that we can come to Jesus for knowledge. But the fact that Jesus is a king, that's uncomfortable because a king can make demands. A king can make rules. A king can tell you what to do. And we don't like that. Because we live in a culture when people say, don't let anyone tell you what to do or who to be. Be yourself. Don't let anyone dictate who you should be or, or how you should act. Do what you want to do. We don't like it when people tell us what to do. And so we don't like the idea of a king. But that is who Jesus is. That's what the notice says. And do you see it's written in three languages? It's written in Aramaic. Uh, that was the language of the people. It was written in Latin. That was the official language of the army. And it was written in Greek, which was sort of the international language of the empire. You see, God wanted it so that everyone walking past could read this charge and know that here is the king. And the question for us is, how will we respond to this king? Because you see, a king is a king no matter what. Whether you bow to him or not, he's still a king. So the question is, will we submit to this king? Or will we rebel against him? Well, we'll see more about that in just a moment. But we've thought about the notice and we've seen God's plan there. That whereas Pilate thought he was just doing his job, God had a deeper plan. Well, now we're going to have the second part of the reading. So it's John chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. We thought about the notice. The notice above Jesus's head and now we're going to think about the lot. Our eyes now are cast down below the cross to the soldiers on duty who take Jesus's clothes and divide them amongst them. But there's one item of clothing we read which is seamless and so the soldiers don't want to rip that one apart so they cast lots for it. In other words they gamble for it uh, to see who will get it. And on the surface, that just looks like these soldiers are doing their job. They do what they've done a load of other times before, taking the clothes of the criminals that they're crucifying and dividing them amongst them. Here's a way for them to gain a bit of profit out of these crucifixions. But we need to look deeper, don't we? And John makes this explicit. He says in verse 24, this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. John is telling us, he's telling us that this is all part of God's plan. 
that this fulfills a psalm that King David, who was king of Israel at the time, had written a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. And he's saying, look, look what's going on. God's plan is being fulfilled that David wrote about. And if you look back to Psalm 22, what you see is that this psalm, if you read it through, it's incredible how much of this is about Jesus being crucified, though it was written a thousand years before. For instance, it says, I'm going to read three verses of this, the last of which is the one that John quotes. It says, in verse 16 to 18 of Psalm 22, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Do you see how that is about the crucifixion of Jesus? And as it says there at the end, that they would divide his clothes amongst them. Now just think, take a moment and think about God's control, God's sovereignty over the whole situation, that this is what would happen over people who have no idea that they're fulfilling God's purposes. You see, it must have been that the custom would have to be that soldiers would divide the criminals' clothes amongst them. And it would have to be that Jesus would have one item of clothing that was seamless and therefore that they didn't want to divide amongst them, but that they wanted to gamble for. And that that's what they did. You see, Jesus, uh, God is in control even of the desires of the soldiers in order for them to fulfill all that God has purposed. Now, why is this significant? What's the meaning behind this detail that God is in control of? Well, we see a couple of things here. First is to see this is what mankind does to God's king. Here is the king. We've already seen that with the, the title above his head. Here is the king. And what does mankind do to God's king? We kill him. We reject him. And God knew that this would happen a thousand years before it did. But this is what we do to God. We reject him. We said before that if Jesus is a king, you've either got to submit to him or rebel against him. And what did we do? We rebelled against him. And this is what we each do. This is what we all do. We rebel against God. We reject God. And we all need to take this on board, that we are not merely victims in this world, but we are rebels. Rico Tice, uh, an evangelist at a church in the middle of London, has said this about the current situation we're in with the spread of the coronavirus. He said this, in the midst of this crisis, we have to keep praying that we and others will keep making the move from seeing ourselves as victims to realising that we're primarily rebels. You see, actually, that is what we are. We're rebels against God. And this is ultimately seen in us rejecting Jesus and crucifying him. But we also need to see that this is God's plan. This was always God's plan, that his king would come and would be killed. But why? Why would God plan that his king would be killed? Well, we need to see that actually the moment of our greatest rebellion against God was the moment when God achieved our rescue. And in order to understand that, we're going to have the next part of our reading. This is John chapter 19, verses 28 to 37. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. 
But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And lastly, we're thinking about the bones. Jesus has died. He breathed his last, he shouted out, it is finished, and he is dead. And the Jews go to Pilate and ask for the bodies of those on the crosses to be taken down because it's a Sabbath the next day and they don't want the bodies on the crosses. And so the soldiers need to come around and check that everyone is dead and those who aren't dead, they break their legs. Now they do that because in order to stay alive on a cross, you have to push up with your feet in order to be able to breathe. But if your legs are broken, you can't do that. And therefore you die quickly from asphyxiation. So the soldiers go round from cross to cross, breaking the legs of the criminals on each of them. But when they come to Jesus, they find that he's already dead. But to make sure, they shove a spear into his side. And it says that out comes blood and water. Now, medics now say different things about what that means, about where the spear went into Jesus and what it hit inside him. But they all pretty much agree. Therefore, it, what it's saying is Jesus was definitely dead. But all this means that while other criminals' legs were broken, Jesus's weren't. Now, on the surface, that looks like, well, everyone's just doing what they should be doing. The Jews are asking for the bodies to come down and the soldiers are, are making sure that all the criminals are dead. But of course, we need to look deeper and see God's plan. And John helps us with that. He makes it explicit in verse 36. He says, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. John's saying, this is all according to God's plan. Now, what's the scripture that's being fulfilled? Well, to understand this, we need to go back a long way. We need to go back before the time of King David. We need to go back to the time of the Exodus. What was going on then? Well, God's people at that time, the Israelites, were enslaved in Egypt. They were being cruelly treated and they were crying out to God to be rescued. And God sent Moses to be their rescuer. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and asked Pharaoh to let his people go, to let God's people go. And Pharaoh said no. So God sent plagues on the land of Egypt and against Pharaoh. And the last of those plagues was the plague of the firstborn, that in every household the firstborn son would die. But the Israelites were told by God to take a lamb and sacrifice that lamb, kill that lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorposts. And God said, then when the angel of the Lord goes through the land, killing the firstborn son in every household, when he sees the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, he will pass over that house and the family will be safe. And that's what happened. They painted the blood on the doorposts and the angel of the Lord went through and slaughtered in every household where there wasn't a lamb killed. And after that, Pharaoh told them to go. And so God's people left Egypt and went to the land that God then promised to give them. But there was a curious instruction. When God told them to slaughter the lamb, what they were then to do with the lamb after they painted the blood on the doorpost was to roast the meat and to eat it. But God told them, don't break the bones of the lamb. Now, that must have seemed like a curious instruction. Why would he tell them not to break the bones of the lamb? And I wonder how many of them thought this is just a weird instruction. But actually... What we see here in John is that when God looked at the lamb, the Passover lambs that they were going to sacrifice, 
he saw his son. He saw the fact that Jesus was going to be crucified. And he said, don't break the bones of the lamb because, well, because my son's bones won't be broken. Now, just think for a moment again about how much control God therefore has over the situation when Jesus is crucified to such that other people's bones are broken. But his aunt, Jesus's aunt, he had to make it such that Jesus would be crucified just before the Sabbath so that the Jews would go to Pilate and ask for the bodies to be taken down. He had to make it such that Jesus died uh, early enough so that his bones wouldn't be broken so that when the soldiers went round they would check that the people were dead and Jesus was already dead God's control is staggering in all this but this also points us to the meaning the fact that Jesus's bones weren't broken points us to the meaning of the cross you see when we look at Jesus we need to see that he is the fulfilment of the Passover lamb. His bones weren't broken, which shows that he is the ultimate Passover lamb. And he is that because when he died, he was rescuing us from slavery. Not from slavery in Egypt, but slavery to sin. That's what John says we're enslaved to. We see that earlier in John's Gospel, that we're all slaves to sin. And sin, as we've already seen, is us rejecting God, rebelling against God, rebelling against Jesus, rebelling against his kingship. And therefore we deserve punishment. We deserve death. But Jesus came to be our rescuer. He came to be our Passover lamb. And he was slaughtered for us so that we could be rescued, so that we could become God's people, so that we could bow in submission to Jesus, our king, and be his people, forgiven by him, rescued by him, redeemed by him. And that's why none of Jesus's bones were broken. So we've thought about the notice, the lot and the bones. Three things that we see in this passage where people who are just doing their everyday thing actually are achieving God's purpose, God's plan. His plan for this event, his son's crucifixion, which he'd been planning for all eternity down to the smallest detail. And we've seen the meaning of this, that this is the king, the king of glory, who is suffering and dying to be the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, to establish his kingdom. And he establishes a kingdom through beating and killing, but not beating and killing his enemies, but rather being beaten and killed for his enemies, for you and me that we might become part of his people. And so how will you respond to what we've looked at this afternoon? Well, one way to respond is to use the words of the next song that we're going to sing. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died.
going to lead us in a final prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, in the cross of Jesus we see the cost of sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. thank you for joining us for this service of course we leave jesus at this point dead and in the tomb but do come back and join us on easter sunday morning for our 10 30 service uh, where we will celebrate jesus risen from the dead Love so amazing.